Hello, people! <laughs> I kind of sound Welsh. We seem to be in for a scientific exposition. So, sit back, grab your popcorn, and enjoy the show. So, <laughs> this is going to be such a boring video, but then I decided to have wine. <laughs> Cheers! Now, we all had made videos when we have been drinking. But maybe I was a bit too hasty in my previous comment, as perhaps this person is not as qualified as they should be, to make videos about science. So, today, okay, first of all, I was listening to happy music getting ready for this. I would like to make this complaint to all, all the rap writers, because I know, well, I was going to say, <laughs> sarcastically, all you rap song writers in the Flat Earth community, but we have rap singers and songwriters in the Flat Earth community. We have multiple. So here is my complaint. Um, please do not put offensive, um, objectionable phrases in the middle of a really good song. Is she actually telling rap artists to stop putting objectionable phrases into rap lyrics? If Biggie Smalls wasn't already dead, I think that single suggestion alone would have probably killed him. I was listening to Work From Home, <laughs> don't even ask, by uh, Fifth Harmony, I don't know, and it's catchy and it's ooh, sexy. <laughs> And it puts me in a good mood. So I was listening to the song and I'm trying to like, like sing along. Ooh, sexy. And then it gets to this one part and I'm singing along. And because I've been listening to it lately, I know the words. And so the words kind of come out. You're the boss at home. Uh, I like you. But no one tells me what to do. How about we just skip all this? and get right to the science, or this video may be much longer than it really needs to be. David Weiss from the YouTube channel Deeper in the Rabbit Hole made a comment in chat in relation to what the Globebusters were talking about that I thought was very insightful. The topic of the conversation was there is an electromagnetic effect between the sun and the earth that is responsible for some of what we observe that we mislabel as things like gravity. Um, there are four fundamental forces in the universe. Strong, weak, electromagnetic and gravity. And Orphan Red here is claiming that electromagnetic radiation from the sun is being mislabeled as the force of gravity. Gravity, in Newtonian physics, is a force exerted between two bodies of mass and is always directed towards the center of mass of each object. Since F equals mass times acceleration, and gravity is a force that causes acceleration at 9.8 meters per second squared on the Earth, then since acceleration equals the force of an object being pulled towards the center of the Earth, the weight of an object would be given by weight equals mass times gravity having nothing to do with electromagnetic radiation at all. The force we personally experience as gravity is just our weight being a product of our mass times the Earth's gravitational constant. So any object in a gravitational field will experience a force towards the center of mass. And in our case, it would be a force directed downward towards the center of the Earth. It matters nothing about the interactions of electromagnetic fields between the Earth and the Sun. And the Earth and the Sun would still have gravity, even if both didn't have an electromagnetic field. However, in general relativity, 
Gravity is thought of a little differently. It is thought of as a fictitious or an inertial force. In general relativity, gravity, instead of being an actual force, is thought more to be the natural geodesic path an object would take through the curvature of the space-time, of which it is in. In this model, a model we call the theory of gravity, mass, produces distortions in the gravitational field which light, being electromagnetic radiation, will be deflected by these distortions and follow the natural geodesic path, which is the shortest distance between two points, in curved space. Um, among other things. The idea that the sun has a, an electromagnetic ooh, relationship with the earth such that uh, there is a fluorescing effect in the atmosphere. The standard model says that the sun's light travels through the vacuum as radiant energy, hits our atmosphere, and then, ooh, that manifests into visible light, and that all the light bounces around all the air molecules. And all the blue light gets scattered quite easily, and so what happens is that the sky looks blue from all this sunlight, full spectrum light, scattering around and then bouncing into your eye. And ooh, by the time it bounces into your eye, because it's been scattered, it is your, it's the blue light that's bouncing into your eye. Fluorescence, as per Wikipedia, is the visible or invisible radiation emitted by certain substances as a result of incident radiation of a shorter wavelength such as x-rays or ultraviolet light. This is how fluorescent light bulbs work. They pass a high voltage through the ends of the bulb, exciting the gases which produces a non-visible UV photon. That strikes the phosphor coating on the inside of the bulb, then re-emitting another photon with a longer wavelength in the visible light region. How does this exactly relate to the electromagnetic field interactions between the Sun and the Earth? The sun emits UV light, but is she seriously suggesting that around the earth is a glass sphere with a phosphor coating that glows invisible blue light? One of the things that I think we could do more of that would improve science and start reining in the rampant scientism that has completely taken over science, replaced it with a nonsense religion. Is she really using a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson to promote a flat earth agenda? Oh the humanity! Dr. Tyson is of course correct, that science doesn't need to be proven true. In fact, it can't be, as science doesn't deal with proofs, it deals with explanations. Specifically by providing naturalistic explanations for natural phenomenon. While one shouldn't confuse education with intelligence, generally speaking people with no education are not among the great minds of history. And I find it interesting to note that she attributes the quote never confuse education with intelligence to herself, when this web page says it is unknown who the original author of the quote really was. Um, one of the things we could do to protect ourselves a little bit from that phenomenon would be to entertain alternative models that are equally plausible. Some people always seem to want to use the least parsimonious of explanations. Ceteris paribus, which is Latin for all things being equal, we take the most parsimonious of explanations which require the least amount of assumptions. Plausible does not mean they're equal to established confirmed models that actually have been demonstrated to work and make predictions. If you run a current through a wire and you reverse it, oh, and so it changes directions many, many times per second, many, many, 900 times per second, what happens is it induces a magnetic field. And so then you can use that magnetic field to do things. You can levitate an object at two magnetic fields that will repel each other. Any current flow in a wire will produce a magnetic field. And high frequency magnetic fields generated from high alternating current is a very well known and understood phenomenon called 
Electrodynamic suspension, where high-frequency high current will produce magnetic fields that induce localized currents in levitating metal, called eddy currents. This has been and, demonstrated ooh, since the 40s. Here's the cool part. If you take um, certain types of light bulbs with gases like neon light bulbs, they will fluoresce when you bring them close by because there's this really cool and weird relationship between magnetic fields and current. So if you have the current going in the different directions, then it induces a magnetic field, and then the magnetic field can be all sneaky and it can induce a current depending on how your setup is. <laughs> It's very complicated, not really. I just have had wine and I'm not going to go into the details. <laughs> that is because I seriously doubt that she actually knows any of the details. There is nothing mysterious about the relationship between current and magnetism. Or the fact that fluorescent lights glow in the presence of a strong electrical field. Nikola Tesla wanted to use this very principle near the turn of the 19th century to deliver wireless electricity to people's homes and is the basis for wireless power transfer which allows personal handheld computer gadgets to charge wirelessly. You know, practical applications of technology based upon confirmed scientific models that often read claims is all just scientism. Some gases fluoresce when you put them in a magnetic field and so, or you can run current through them and then also they will fluoresce. This is how neon light bulbs in 1980s light offices worked, which just led to depression and headaches and general nausea amongst the office cubicle dwellers. <laughs> Never work in office work. It destroys your soul. If you have an office job, quit. Do anything else. Just go do something creative. It doesn't matter how much money you're making, you're gonna spend it on healthcare, mental stability issues, buying back your soul. <laughs> it's not worth it. So, but neon lights, that's how they work. And then the neon gas in the tube fluoresces. That's the fluorescent light. Magic happens. What she just said, is incredibly wrong. In a fluorescent light, it is not the gas that is fluorescent, it is the phosphorescent coating on the inside of the bulb that is what is fluorescent. That is why phosphor is called a fluorescent material. David Weiss in chat mentioned the idea or brought up the idea that what if the sun was having this effect rather than the sun being this huge ball of fusion. Let's be honest, scientists have been trying to replicate fusion in the lab since the 1960s. And it's only last year, like in the last few years, you keep getting like a group in China saying, oh, we've done fusion and give us more grant money. And it makes a big splash in the community, the science community. Oh, finally fusion is gonna be our next energy source. And then we find out that Actually, the results can't be replicated and they probably just, it was just a fake result because they wanted more funding. This is how, that's my interpretation. We have had fusion since the first thermonuclear device was detonated in 1952 called Ivy Mike. Now, I realize that she is talking about controlled fusion, not thermonuclear weapons, but that also has been produced in numerous reactor plants using lasers as early as the 70s and 80s. Other models instead of using lasers to heat up the hydrogen to the required temperatures to undergo fusion, use a technique called Z-pinch, using magnetic fields to constrict the hydrogen to very high temperatures. Even MIT has a fusion reactor called the Alcator, see Mod Tokamak, which ran for 23 years, until it was shut down last year. And the first prototype for a commercial fusion reactor goes online this spring with the first commercial unit being built in 2025. It should be noted that the demonstration of the Ivy might confirm the model that lighter isotopes would release energy as they bind it together under high temperatures. If the model was wrong, the hydrogen bomb would have never detonated. I am alleging 
<laughs> that they are faking the results. It's all about publisher parish. If the sun is uh, an electromagnetic source of energy current, ooh, a magnetic field inducer, that the sun could have the effect of causing gases in our atmosphere to fluoresce. And interestingly enough, I looked up what color nitrogen fluoresces to because our atmosphere is made up of like 78%, 80% nearly uh, nitrogen. I think it's 78% nitrogen. And so I thought, okay, well, if there's any truth to, to what David is suggesting and just off the top of his head, I think nitrogen would have to fluoresce at a blue wavelength. And it does. <laughs> Nitrogen fluoresces blue. And so, yes, that would make sense if the sun was having the effects of, um, of inducing fluorescence in our atmosphere then that would be why the sky is blue because that would be the nitrogen fluorescing so cheers david weiss for such a great insight this is where orphan red's notable lack of actual knowledge on this topic really comes into play while astrophysicists have co-opted the term fluorescence and do refer to what they call nitrogen fluorescence it is not actually fluorescence at all it is scintillated light, meaning that it isn't the gas that is re-emitting a photon to a lower wavelength, but a flash of light produced when a charge particle, such as a cosmic ray, passes through the transparent nitrogen gas. In other words, scientific words have specific meanings, but are sometimes misused. Even by scientists. Luminescence, the emission of light, not from heat such as the light from the gas inside of a fluorescent bulb. Fluorescence, the ray emission of light from a shorter wavelength to a longer one, such as the light from the phosphor coating of a fluorescent bulb. Scintillation, a flash of light due to the passing of a charged particle through a transparent medium. If David or Orphan Red were right, we would not have a nice blue sky but it would be more like the flashes of snow on an old analog television with no signal. I just think that's wonderful. It just all kind of fits nicely. And all we need now is someone to explore that to see, okay, it fits nicely and it's a lovely story, but is there any truth to it? Is, is it a plausible explanation? Is it an adequate alternative theory for why our sky is blue? Ooh, ooh. Feeling like it, ooh, I, I'm like, ooh, I don't know. You are right. You don't know. And that is about the only thing you said in your entire video that I agree with. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe, and feel free to leave a comment to tell me what you think.